It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul's going to go on a rant. I just, I just feel it. <laughs> Let's find out what's going on with Paul Thorat and the world of Windows next. Netcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by Cashfly at c a c h e f l y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Thorat, episode two hundred six, recorded April twenty eighth, twenty eleven. I thought about you in the shower. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Go to Assist Express. If you're an IT or software consultant, up your competitive edge and grow your business with Go to Assist Express for a free 30-day trial. Visit gotoassist.com/windows. And by Carbonite. Backing up the files on your PC or Mac is safe and easy with Carbonite. For a free trial plus two free months with purchase, go to carbonite.com. Offer code Windows. And by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high-quality website or blog. For a free 14-day trial, go to squarespace.com/windows and be sure to check out their annual plan for savings of up to 20% off. It's time for Windows Weekly, and now here he is, the Wizard of Windows, the Maven of Microsoft. The I had a whole bunch of these. Let me think. The uh, oh, Chancellor of the Exchequer for the Xbox. <laughs> The Home Secretary for Windows Home Server. The King of Connect, Mr. Paul Thorat. Wow, that's pretty good. Pretty good. Off the huh? top of your head. Yeah, I made those all up. By the How way, you doing? it's Thursday. I am well. I am well. Have you, uh, you're, you've got a little sniffle, I, I know. Are you, are you, I'm, uh, not, I'm not happy about this. What's the matter, Paul? I don't know. I just have a cold. You know, it's How does going this around. It's going around. Do you have a Windows virus? <laughs> if I did, I got it at the Apple Store. <laughs> really? <laughs> that's the only place I've been. I, I, that's the only place I could have gotten this. Wow. I haven't left the house other than that. Well, um, do you want to do a, a, take a nap and then do the show? <laughs> no, I'd like to do the show and then take a nap. Have you been playing Portal 2 at all? Mm -hmm. Did you play Portal I actually, 2? Actually, I finished the single player. It's awesome, isn't Part. it? Part. Yeah, I'm going to play the there's a co-op mode. Now, how does that work? You have to get a you have to figure out who your partner is ahead of time. Yeah, you can play online or you can play split screen, I think. I haven't tried it, ah. but uh, Yeah. So, I'm just going to do it with my son and uh, Yeah, I was thinking of doing it with my son. There's a check there's it out. kind of a great father-son togetherness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, son, blow an orange hole over there, and I'll blow a blue one here. Let's see what happens. <laughs> well, I, right, but I mean, it's, and there's no it's killing. puzzle solving. No, this is, this is yeah. literally an intelligent thing you could do with your son. It's positive, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny. My son's been playing it. Actually, he's, um, I, you know, he, I was stuck almost toward the end. It was almost, I think it was chapter eight. Yep. And I was stuck. And uh, he said, what you doing? What you doing, Dad? I said, playing Portal 2. He said, oh, I'm really interested in playing that. Is that, the, can I play? I said, well, this is, this will be way too hard for you. We're, we're almost at the end of the game. And he said, in like sure. three minutes, he solved the whole thing. He never played Portal before. He knew, he just kind of intuitively figured it out. So I think uh, he'll be a good partner. Good partner. I think they got the difficulty just right on this yeah, one. Yeah, it, was, I, it started I, really one, easy. It was much easier. Yeah, and it, it, it helps get your mind into the groove of what the thing is. Yes. Because, you know, anytime you put it down, and come back. I found that first couple of minutes was right. momentary this, brain freeze. You right. know, I, I, uh, yes, I thought I think I like it even better. Oh yeah, yeah, than Portal One. I mean, they've yep. really done a nice job, and the story is great. Yeah, I like. I don't want to give you a spoiler, anybody, but I do like the uh, way they go back through the eras. The kind of the, it's the Genesis I love that. story. They, they give you a history of the yeah. Accenture. Science or whatever it's called. Aperture and, uh, Science, which wasn't... Aperture Science, excuse me. And the original name, which wasn't Aperture Science. It's great. I love it. Right. You find out the woman who became the GLaDOS. Shh. Shh. Well, that no, it's not giving anyone... It's not even... It's not giving anything way to say that. But, I mean, it's, it's just interesting. It's a, it's a, the Genesis story. It's how yeah. it all happened. It's well done. Yeah, I love it. That's I mean, kind of like a Howard Hughes... Uh, you know, kind of awesome, uh, you know, um, adventure guy. Yeah, what's his name? Is uh, Clay Cave? Yeah, Cave Shirky or something? I don't know. 
Yeah. No, that's somebody else. I, I, it's, it's really well done. <laughs> I, I think the only thing I don't like about it from a plot standpoint is the, you know, the British robot. Um, I which like you, him. Well, I do too until five minutes into the game where it's like enough with the rich, oh, you know, yeah. Ricky Gervais style right. halting is, speech. Who is that voice actor? This, it's so familiar. I know. Well, I, actually, it's the guy who co-did the original Office with Ricky Gervais, and he's a stand-up comedian in his own right. And I don't remember his name, but um, oh. that's where that he may. I mean, for all I know, he invented this stilty, you know, weird language Stephen style. Stephen Merchant? No, really? It's the guy who does the. Uh, well, that's cool. Yeah. No, it's a legitimate. Yeah, I mean, the voice acting has gotten a lot of good press. Although I would just point out that when you never see lips moving on screen because the voices are always coming out of robots, right. you know, doing voice acting is not exactly it's that not hard. But yeah. but they did get obviously the actors are great, so that's right. cool. It's very cool. Yeah. Uh, so I think we have a number of things to talk about. We do. Today, unfortunately, with, unfortunately, <laughs> so much stuff. Starting with... Uh, By the way, if we're here on here long enough, today at 4 p.m. my time, or I guess, what is that, 3 p.m. your time? The three, Royal, the royal 1, Wedding will start. 1 p.m. your time is Microsoft's earnings. Oh, well, let's hang on uh, until that happens. Yeah, I don't know if we'll be here long enough. but Because we've had Google and Apple, both yeah. Apple making like almost twice as much as it made this year, this time last year. I mean, just yeah. huge. Yeah. I, I, I cease to be amazed by this. You know, it's just the way it is now it's with incredible. those guys. Well, you bought an Air. Even you fell for it. How'd that go, by the way? <laughs> not, not, not well, and we'll get to that. Okay, stand by. Stand by, but let's start with Microsoft's uh, numbers. Uh, not, to, not a quarterly result yet, but no. a pretty big number. I'm getting my um, whistle ready. This is from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection. Go ahead. Okay, <laughs> so as of, I don't know, oh, it must have been last Friday, which was the 18th month anniversary of the release of Windows 7, Microsoft announced that they have sold over 350 million licenses to Windows 7. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Stop, thief! <laughs> I'm gonna only. I'm gonna paraphrase a joke that my friend John told me last week, which was he had an uh, image of a Scottish man with bagpipes falling to his death, and then landing on the bagpipes, and they kind of <laughs> wheeze out as he dies. You're like, <laughs> that's, a bit fun. that's what you reminded me. Anyway, um, so that's obviously a huge number, and Microsoft, you know, again, fa fastest selling OS in history, yada yada yada. But you know, every time you see a number like this, or every time I see a number like this, I always you know, kind of go back and look at it and think like, that doesn't actually seem like a lot compared to how many PCs would have been sold in this time frame. For example, uh, we know that uh, PC makers last year in just 12 months sold 350 million computers. So how is it that it took Windows 7, three, you know, 18 months to sell that many units, right? In some ways uh, that might sound like that maybe people were still buying Vista and XP. I, well, I think we are. I think that's the point. And the thing is, it's worse than that. It's it's worse than it sounds because Windows Seven is the first version of Windows ever where a lot of people actually bought retail copies. So the bundling with PCs is even high, more higher skewed toward other versions of Windows than it would be normally. So I did a little bit of math. Some other bloggers did some math, and you know the numbers that kind of come out. And I have to look at I have to look at these because I just can't retain these in my head. But they compared these sales to uh, how Windows Vista and Windows XP sold in a similar time frame. And the way it works out is that, uh, let's see, uh, you know, Vista sold about 180 million licenses in its first 18 months. Almost half. Uh, yeah, just a little over half. Um, Windows XP sold about 130 million licenses, so that's significantly down. Now, of course... Uh, the PC market is bigger now. But still, that's you know, a lot. Things have changed. So the other way to look at it would be percentages, you know. Um, and I think I'll, I'll have to look those up. But I think that, um, let me see if I can find those. That's huge. Yeah, so Windows 7 has accounted for 67% of all PCs sold during the first 18 months of the market. Okay. Uh, this compares to 44% for Windows Vista, huh. but 54% for Windows XP, which makes some sense. I think that I think the thing, and I wrote this in an article because it's amazing to me how people forget history. A lot of people are are saying, you know, well, Windows Seven is obviously such a huge deal because Vista was like the shining success story and um, on all this stuff. And you know, people forget this, but actually, in the first year and a half that Windows XP was on the market, Windows XP was not a shining success story. In fact, Windows XP was the most insecure OS that Microsoft ever released. 
it came out with that huge UNPNP bug uh, that caused them to go back and really look at stuff. It got slammed again and again in the following year. They actually had to halt development of Windows to see if they could fix this problem, came up with the trustworthy computing initiative, and then eventually shipped Service Pack 2, which was really the first substantial release that was part of this trustworthy computing initiative and got XP back on the right track. You know, the, the reason that XP was such a huge success over time was really because its successor, Windows Vista, was delayed so many times. So XP was kept in the market and, and kind of extended out. You know, Microsoft has said that we would have made Windows XP Service Pack 2 a new version of Windows. It was just that we felt like we should give it away because the original version of XP was so bad. You know, so, I mean, XP was sort of artificially on the market for much, much longer than it would I have been. I see. I didn't realize that. Well, you're right. Service Pack 2 was a huge shift. We forget. I mean, I think people yeah. just forget. You know, you look at XP now and you're like, my God, it's on, you know, it's on like 750 million computers. It's got to be the most successful version of Windows of all time. It's like, well, yeah. I mean, from a staying power perspective, absolutely. But the truth is, out of the gate, that was Microsoft's first hint that something was really, really wrong with the way it was developing software. And it, like I said, it caused them... It, they actually halted development of Windows uh, for some amount of time so that they could find out what was wrong. Of course, Windows uh, ME, its predecessor, wasn't so hot either. <laughs> well, it wasn't so hot from a maybe a sales perspective. But again, I, I, it was just Windows 95. The impact was lower just because fewer people were buying. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, not, this doesn't uh, mean that Windows 7 isn't awesome. I love Windows 7. But I, I think it's interesting that less than 70% of the computers that have been sold with, since Windows 7 came out, actually come with Windows 7. And it's actually well under 70% because remember, again, a lot of those Windows 7 sales are retail sales. So it's possible that Windows 7 is going out on roughly the same percentage, or, or has, I should say, in the first 18 months, gone out on the same percentage of computers roughly as, say, Windows XP did. And I think, again, I lost the number, but I want to say that was, yeah. Over 50. 50 54%, yeah. something like that. So, I mean, there's a lot of computers being sold without Windows. or It's kind of interesting. Other, other stuff. I think they're sold with yeah. Windows. People don't. Well, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Do That's what know? I'm saying. I, I think that in certain uh, markets in the world, maybe, uh, that's not the case. I mean, we tend to have a very U.S.-centric view right. here, as you know, or, or um, you know, a major market view. I think most people buying a PC are buying yeah. it with an operating system, and it's going to be Windows. They're not going to buy it with, well, I guess some are sold with Linux, but it can't be more than one or two points. Well, but the fact remains, I mean, uh, speaking very roughly, I mean, 500,000 computers or more, 500, I'm sorry, million computers or more yeah, have been sold. Lot. Yeah. That Without means 100 million, 150 million, whatever, have been sold, maybe 175 million have been sold in the same time period without Windows 7 on it. That's what the so heck weird. are those people buying, you know? Yeah. I would imagine that the Windows 7 percentages go up as the time goes by. And I would also point out, by the way, that this 18-month time period is exactly halfway between the release of Windows 7 and the release of Windows 8. So it's an interesting thing to look at now because we're literally halfway uh, to the next version of Windows, which I, hmm. say, I say somewhat confidently because, of course, the team that's running Windows right now actually has their act together and will no doubt ship this thing exactly on time. So right. that's something I don't think I would have said <laughs> you know, at any time in the past. But given how these guys handled Windows 7, I think we can say that. Is it uh, Deistu suggesting in the chat room? Maybe he's right that the business machines don't don't. No, I mean, our, I don't. Would you buy? I guess you'd buy a license and then buy a lot of hardware. So maybe that's what it is that they're buying the license separate. No, but that would still count. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that could. I think business, yeah, uh, use maybe factors into this certainly. Um, but again, you know, it, if businesses were buying Windows licenses just to put on existing PCs, which by the way has probably happened at a higher clip than That's ever true. with this version of Windows. Then it's even more. It makes these numbers even more skewed in the direction yeah. I'm saying. Yes, exactly. So I don't know. I'm always curious about this. It is no doubt that, I mean, 300... Listen, whoever you are, Apple or Ubuntu or whatever, you'd give anything to have that kind of number. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to look back on it. Oh, my God. Are it's you not kidding? Even 350 million copies of anything. It's crazy. <laughs> but again, when you look at it from this other perspective, it's very strange. So it's... It's kind of a paradox in a way. Um, now we'll see in the very in, in Microsoft's uh, earnings report, but yeah. I would guess that that's uh, there's a lot of profit in that 
<laughs> that license. I understand they're doing okay. <laughs> I mean, really, it's not. Once you've written a, it, it's not a dying business. <laughs> it's free yeah. to make copies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, always better to be in the software business in terms of margins than it is in the hardware yep. business. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, good. So, what time again on the uh, on the quarterly results? Four p.m. So one p.m. Yeah. So uh, an hour and a half. Just talk slower. Okay. You see, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> ha! Uh, let's take a break because I just want everybody okay. to celebrate with me. <laughs> I was a little worried that if I blew this whistle, it would be so piercing it would hurt your ears, but I don't. My cats keep rolling around. I don't know. It sounds like the tea's on. All right. Uh,. <laughs> I need one of those. Like a, it's a, like a terrorism whistle? What it's is that? It's a terrorism whistle, yes. It says, don't you see Department of Homeland Security on it? So I blow this uh, whistle. I'm sorry. I'm making a poor, poor, poor Randy. He came in here in good faith to watch the show. He's a big fan of the show, and I'm making fun of his whistle. <whistles> <laughs> Let's take a break. <laughs> It's what is that? What is it that Woody Guthrie used to have on his uh, on his guitar? He used to have it used to said, "This guitar fights fascists. This oh, whistle geez. fights the terrorists." <laughs> I need a better whistle. <laughs> Let's take a break and talk a little bit about Carbonite.com, the best backup solution in the world. If you don't yet have Carbonite and you are just saying, oh, I'll back up my stuff someday. I asked my dad. I had my dad, uh, 77, great guy, and smart, college professor, you know, very smart, much smarter than I am. I said, Dad, you know, he writes books and stuff. I said, Dad, what you do, uh, what you do for backup? I try to do this, you know, in a kind of non-judgmental, kind of friendly, hey, Dad, tell me about your backup strategy. And he says, well... Every once in a while, I'll get a USB thumb drive, and I'll put it in there, and I'll copy important files to it. I said, Dad, a couple of problems. First of all, every once in a while, uh, like what? When you think of it, right? Nah, not going to work. Because the hard drive's going to die, and it's going to be, when was the last once in a while? A month ago? What did you do since then? That's gone. And the USB key, how much can you put on there? How big is it? You're just putting a few things on there, and then where are you? you keeping it close to hand? Or is, or, you know, I mean... Okay, this is fine. I'm not against this. But, Dad, here's a car. I set him up with Carbonite. Carbonite.com. Because here's what happens. You put it on your computer, PC or Mac, and it immediately starts backing up. And it continues backing up in the background every time you're online. So you don't have to say, whenever I get around to it. It just does it. And because it's online, first of all, you never lose it. You know exactly where it is. It's in the cloud. And if the worst happens, you know you have a fire and everything burns down, including your thumb drives, you've still got a copy. Best of all... At less than $5 a month, Carbonite's a great way to do cloud storage, unlimited backup, everything on your internal drive for 5 bucks a month. And you can access it anytime. You don't have to wait till disaster happens. You can get on uh, your Carbonite account on any computer or on an iPhone or an Android phone or um, BlackBerry phones, and there's your stuff. It's cloud storage. It's available to you at all times. It's really a clever solution. You could try it free right now for two weeks. You don't need a credit card. Just this one little word. Windows. Go to Carbonite.com and use the offer code Windows and you can get started with Carbonite. If you decide you want to buy it, by the way, you uh, the 14 month subscription, you'll get a, uh, the 12 month subscription, you'll get an additional two months, 14 months free when you use Windows as the offer code. Carbonite, you got to back it up to get it back. So do it right with Carbonite. Somebody said, Oh, look, Leo's tweeting. <laughs> It's an analog tweet. So um, I can't believe this. I remember when we started Tech TV in 1998, the Department of Justice just a month later sued Microsoft. And we had a story <laughs> for the next we six that, years. We call this the good old days. <laughs> Them's was the good old days. And here we are. What is every that? Every basket had a red apples in it and <laughs> the sun came up every day. <laughs> and now here we are 13 years later, finally... Our long national nightmare is almost over. Except that it isn't, right? 
<laughs> yeah, it's you just know? starting again. I, I, yeah. I mean, I, so Microsoft today is a completely different company because of this, in part. I mean, in, in some ways, the European stuff was more damaging, I would say, to the company. Uh, but it all started with the U.S. case, of course. And that initial... It took them a while to get there. It took them, it literally took until a, until a judge said, hey, I think we should break this company up until they finally capitulated and, and settled. And, uh, you know, here we are. So, but, but the interesting thing is that I think uh, as of the beginning of May or May 12th, it is, the oversight of the company that has been occurring since the end of that settlement, right, or since the beginning, I guess the beginning of the settlement, uh, is ending. And they're not going to extend it again, which they've already extended it once. And it's interesting, the reaction to this news, right? Because there, I guess there are two ways you could look at this. You could think, well, in their words, uh, obviously, the, the settlement worked. So there's right. no reason for this to continue. Job done. Uh, job, yeah, mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. You know, the other way to look at it, though, is, of course, that Microsoft is no longer the industry superpower that they used to be. And there's some truth to that, you know, in the sense that they don't wield power over the actions of other companies, right? Microsoft used to be able to walk into a room and say, uh, yeah, you're not going to want to make that thing because we're going to make one of those maybe sometime in the future. Oh, they, remember, that, people don't remember that. the company would literally just walk away. Yeah. yeah. Or people, or Microsoft would say, well, maybe we'll buy you. And they'd come yeah. and they'd look at everything and say, no, we don't want to buy you. And then they'd kill you. Right. So obviously they're still a huge company. They're still very powerful. Uh, they still have certain kinds of influence in certain markets and so forth. But um, I, they've been run over by so many competitors yeah. now. I think that, uh, you know, very few companies or people would ever be afraid of taking on Microsoft in any particular industry at this point. Um, it's kind of like Hannibal Lecter. Pragmatically. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. It's like Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. You know, after, when, once he hits 80, mm. you could take off the leg irons. Because he's not going to, he's going to gum you into death. Right. You he's can always not, run away. He's harmless. Yeah, you run away from him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is slow moving. <laughs> so. Here yeah, I come. That. I'm going to eat your liver. <laughs> and you go, yeah, see ya. Excuse me. I have such a coughing problem today. Cough away, my friend. Cough away. Here, I'll blow my whistle. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. <clears throat> Anywho. It's interesting. So, uh, obviously, there are other antitrust things going on in the industry around Google especially, but also Apple a little bit. And I think that reflects the state of the market, you know, that that uh, exists today. You know, Microsoft just isn't... That's. You know, I have to be honest. That's uh, the, like superpower. There's, that's, that's life, and there's nothing wrong with it. Microsoft, as we'll see this afternoon, is making yeah. plenty of money. Well, doing uh, right, but as we've discussed in the past, and this may be some irony to this, uh, if you accept the new age uh, version of the word irony, um, IBM also makes a lot of money and isn't a particularly interesting company. But one of the things that could happen this year is IBM could actually surpass Microsoft from, an, uh, from a market cap. Really? Oh, that's well. interesting. It's, IBM. Yeah, so. Back from the dead. Not well. Not they never really went away. I mean, you know, they you know again they, they've always been around. They make half again as much money as Microsoft. I think it's uh, almost exactly half again as many earning uh, uh, profits wow. and half again as many revenues. But and, and Microsoft is yeah. Regardless of that, is expected to make a lot of money uh, for the previous quarter. Um, so yeah, they're they're doing fine and all that. From uh, again, from a certain perspective. Um, which is sort of like the discussion that, you know, Ben Kenobi had with Luke Skywalker, you know, after he, you know, it's like, well, from a certain perspective, what I told you about Darth Vader was true, you know. Okay. The biggest ripoff of my childhood, you know, that, that conversation. You know? Yeah. <laughs> really? So you're still holding a grudge? I still I'm against still that George Lucas that. guy. Liar. Liar! You let us all down, George. And then there's that Jar Jar thing. Oh no, no! I was I was a young guy, so I actually you like harbored Georgia. the grudge toward Ben Kenobi, not toward George Lucas. <laughs> it was Ben's fault, <laughs> who, as we know, is real. Right? Yeah. That damn Ben Kenobi. Bastard. <sighs> Don't let him move into your neighborhood. <laughs> so, have you been? Uh, you know, it's really been really interesting. Yep. To watch the reaction to the Apple iPhone um, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I go back and forth about it, sometimes being irate and sometimes going, come on. 
And yep. uh, it reminds me a little of Antenna Gate. In fact, you, yep. you, you're calling it in your notes and on the website Location Gate, and I think that's fair. Right. And uh, and it reminds me also a little bit. So, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go well, ahead. I'm just saying it, it reminds me a little bit of the brouhaha over Google's Street View collection, yeah. uh, where you know state attorneys yep. general are up in arms over this. What's your take on Location Gate? Well, I, I, and there's a bunch of different perspectives here. I would just say from from a very general perspective, not looking at any one company exactly, I think it's important to remember that Apple, Google, Microsoft all do the same thing, basically, right? Basically. Um, you, have a, you have a device, a smartphone, that has a GPS in it, a Wi-Fi antenna, and a 3G antenna, and you are repeatedly asked to okay different apps to look at your location. Report your location, because that makes this thing more valuable to you, right. such as when you're doing a Foursquare check-in or a Facebook thing or whatever it is, a Google Maps, you know, whatever. I mean, um, should we be shocked and or surprised that this thing is um, registering this information, maybe putting it in a database somewhere, saving it for some reason? You know, I don't think so. I, I think there's some faux indignation around that stuff. For one well, um, no, I, I don't look, know. I'm not going to say people, I, it's, it's no, faux I would go back. To, there's a great video of Steve Jobs from over, well, from a year ago or over a year ago. I don't remember when. It was at one of those All Things D conferences where he spoke very plainly about privacy. And he said, the way that we handle it on the iPhone is we don't let apps handle your privacy. We handle your privacy. So if they want to know something about you, we're the ones that put up the, the block. Or it not. It comes from us. Or, well, they do, but they do put it up. And it, by the way, one of the annoying things about the iPhone, you know, before I moved to Windows Phone, I used to notice this all the time. Are you, you know, do, do, you, want this? do you want it? it oh, yeah, yeah it's, it's annoying. And I, I remember saying, is there a central place where I can go turn this off? I hate right. this thing. But... They would rather be annoying than risk the opportunity for some third-party developer to, you know, screw you over in some way from a privacy. I think I, I do. Yes, and I and I have to say I agree with that. I think Apple uh, fanned the flames by not responding. Well, and, and, and that's yes, and then responding kind of. <laughs> yes, I think belligerently. Yeah, typically, it's typical for Apple. It yeah, is it's typical, typical for Apple. Yes. It's like what? What are you? Um, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, well, I love, I, and I quote this in my article, it's like, you know, question, why is Apple tracking the location of my phone? Apple is not tracking not. the location of your phone. Oh, how could you okay. think that? Well, why are you, why are you logging my location? We are not logging your location. <laughs> but you are! But, but you, well, this is, I, I, to my knowledge, no one else has pointed this out for some reason. I, I find this to be amazing. Day, a few days before Microsoft, uh, before Apple released this statement and, and did the interview with Steve Jobs, Microsoft released a page on their website which explained how they do location oh, aware uh, services. Now, now, listen to the way Apple describes this. This is very interesting. Uh, it says that, this is, again, a matter of semantics. It's funny how often this comes up. What Apple is arguing is that the iPhone or iPad or whatever the device is does not track or log the user's location. Instead, and this is in their words, it tracks and logs the location of Wi-Fi hotspots and cell towers around your current location. Where you are! Some of which may be located more than 100 miles away. Oh, well, all right. Okay. In other words... That's different. In other words, we're not tracking your location. We're tracking all of that stuff we use to triangulate your location. Around That's you. What we're tracking, which I would argue gives you a very general and sometimes even very specific idea of where exactly you were. But, okay, they never say that. What they're saying is... We track this stuff around you, not you. Well, they're saying, and it, it, the problem is, again, I think Apple fired the flame, fanned the flames, mm -hmm. but in, 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 I hate to defend them, but in their defense, I think it's just like the Google thing. They were trying to build a Skyhook-style no, database. Their, their statement purposefully obscures exactly what they're trying to do. Well, that's true. And to understand why, read, uh, read what Microsoft wrote. This is how they described it. By the way, almost exactly the same wording. To provide location services, Microsoft assembles and maintains a database that records the location of mobile cell towers and Wi-Fi access points. Yeah. These data points provide an approximate location of the user's device. Right. Exactly. Yeah. In other words, it does exactly the same thing as iPhone. Right. It's just that Microsoft admits that the reason they do it is to provide a location of the, of the device. Yeah, I don't understand why I, Apple it, obfuscates that. Because... This is how they respond to everything. Apple. Because Apple does this circle <laughs> the wagons. they're big jerks. This is the company that 
cannot admit that this antenna on the outside yeah. of the iPhone is a bad idea. Yeah. You know, I think that I think I, and I, maybe I'm pushing this a little hard, but I believe that Apple is delaying the release of the iPhone 5 as a giant middle finger extended to the world because you said this design wasn't oh. right. Now we're leaving it on the market and people are going to keep buying it. <laughs> so so screw are. you, doubters. They are. They're selling a lot of them. Uh, but that doesn't <laughs> disprove the fact that it's the wrong right. design. Right. I mean, you know, see what I'm saying? They're just so obstinate. It's, yeah, it's, it's a amazing. corporate culture, and I think it's it's probably a mistake in their corporate culture. And it comes from yeah. the top. It comes from Steve Jobs, and that's kind of how Steve is. It is literally from the top, yeah. Yeah. But now, the truth is, stuff. what they're doing is what everybody does. And I, But exactly. I also think I, that it, the exactly. general public doesn't understand that as well as you and I do. So it would behoove all these companies, Microsoft, Google, Apple, everybody, to say, hey, here's what is happening, and here's why. Yeah, and you can opt out of it, but if you opt out of it, you're not going to get all the benefits of these none location of these guys, services. Uh, yeah, none of these guys have offered any real clarity. I, I I will say that not surprisingly, what Apple is going to do, and it's going to answer all the complaints, and it's what I predicted was is simply, well, we're going to fix it. You know, we didn't actually mean to retain this data for that long on the device, so we won't now. We didn't mean to always bring it over unencrypted uh, to the PC, so we're not going to do that anymore. And then in a future version you know, uh, some months from now, perhaps, uh, even the device, the information on the device will be encrypted, and thus we won't be able to, or, or some hacker won't be able to steal it and somehow get your... And that was a legitimate, that is a legitimate concern as well, is that they, they're not fine. protecting you know, fine. us as well. I mean, some of the, you know, uh, uh, privacy advocates by nature are, are a little bit uh, radicalized, right? Yeah. And... Um, Prickly. Yeah. So, that you know, everything is very extreme. And I, I, I look, I get it. I understand. And, and I'm not... You know, it was Scott McNeely years and years ago, a decade ago or more, said, you know, your privacy doesn't exist. Get over it right. or something to that effect. Exactly. Um, and there's a part of me that, of course, you hear that. And of course, you want to recoil against that. But, then you know, OK. Yeah, that's actually kind of the way it is. So and that was a long time ago. I mean, this now, you know, now with these devices, you carry these things around. We carry around multiple devices that can track where we are. Well, and I, and I don't. They've got microphones and cameras in them too. By the way, I mean, yeah, and I, these I, are really the, great spy devices. If you want, there's to spy an somebody. argument that I also sort of recoil against, but then sort of understand, which goes along the lines of, well, if you're not doing anything uh, to be not just embarrassed of, but you know, that could be illegal, then what are you worried about? You know, yeah, of course, I hate to say that. It's a tough one to say because there are always those examples of people who weren't, in fact, doing anything wrong. Right. But then there's this circumstantial evidence that well, makes it seem... And that's it, the Eric Schmidt era said the same thing. He says he was joking, yeah. but he, it, I, that's not the response. The, to me, the simple, very simple response is there is a tit for tat. There's a trade. We, by giving us location data, you do a number of things. You know, you, you save money on GPS is because the AGPS works better. You can do the find my iPhone thing, for instance, or the you know find my Droid thing, or find my Windows phone. You can sure. get traffic information can be uploaded, and then you get oh, valuable listen. traffic maps. There's all these that, valuable benefits. If that GPS thing could be on 24 hours a day, pinging a server or like a satellite or something without impacting the battery, I can assure you that Apple would be tracking exactly where you were. <laughs> you know, that the only reason they're doing this is because that's not feasible from a technological but, standpoint. But there is a benefit to it. And so yeah. what you should be given, everybody should give, be given very clear instructions. This is what you we are doing. This is what you get. If you don't want that, if you're worried yeah, about yeah, yeah. that, I, then turn then, then you could turn I, it off. But understand, listen, you're giving up all of this stuff. I would also, not just all this stuff. It, you, you're not just giving up frou-frou stuff or even stuff that's sort of slightly beneficial. If you're in a car accident on the middle of nowhere, if you get robbed or whatever it is, that phone has GPS in it and can alert 911 to exactly you where go. you are. This is a very, That's this is beyond Sink. valuable. Yeah. This is what I would call a crucial service. Yeah. So I get it. You know, there's a trade off. And yes, you should have certain controls to determine whether or not you opt into this and all that. But you know what? You, you already do. I mean, the thing, the, the notion that this file on the iPhone changes anything really is made up. Yeah. I mean, it's, it really, it's sort of artificial. This thing is going to be fixed quickly enough that it's uh, it's important that this issue was raised, and I think we need to move on. I, I I just it's amazing to me how people get so burned over this kind of thing, you know. I just don't. I don't. Maybe I'm living in a dream world. I don't know, but I just don't. I don't uh, get it. Uh, well, you, it's interesting because you uh, and we haven't. Uh, have I ever met you before? We we haven't talked. 
<laughs> about well, this. Well, we have Mets, yes. But... <laughs> and, and we have the same opinion on this, which is, okay. well, exactly what we just said. I don't want to belabor it. But, um, yeah, and I think there's a lot of hand-wringing that perhaps is, you know, the, the people who are really getting a lot of benefit from this are the Wall Street Journal, who has been pr publishing these privacy, series of privacy articles all along. Yeah, and, uh, right. And coincidentally, right, ahead of, ahead of this, um, they were already doing this. Right. Um, so good for them, you know, for being on the ball on that right. one. But, right. uh, you know, there are technological issues you could kind of discuss. I mean, uh, Microsoft uh, actually stores this information on cloud servers, not on the phones. Um, that's probably <laughs> more to do with the technical limitation of Windows Phone than anything else, or just the immaturity of the platform. I'm sure they would prefer to have it on the phone. But, you know, it's not like it, they decided to do that out of any understanding of privacy or caring about privacy. It's just a different way of doing it, you know. I think the one that people should be outraged about here is actually Google. Um, Google supposedly has this opt-in system, but it's opted in for you by default. So you actually have to go into an Android phone and configure this to be off. And I have to say... Um, well, it's when you first set up your Android phone, they ask you. Yeah, but it's, uh, you know, Android is a hard thing to Apple configure. says it asks you too, by the way. Uh, it does. Because they have this, this box when you first activate the phone or the iPad or the iPod yeah. Touch that says, would you like to send anonymous usage statistics back to Apple? But they're not clear that that includes your location. Okay. Um, but you, if you check that, that's, that's, they say that's their opt-in. Uh, the Android is much more clear. When you first set up an Android phone, you've been. Right? No, but they don't. Well, they want to know. They just don't. Who doesn't? Do what? Apple. Why would they care where you are? <laughs> well, they don't. They don't. I mean, they care where your phone is. <laughs> you happen to be see carrying this, it. By the way, did you see the South Park episode about Apple? <laughs> yes. It was very so, funny. <laughs> it, it's funny. Of course, it's South Park, so they have to ruin it with, you know, this really kind of crass, you know, pointless yeah, that's uh, all right. I like, episode. But, I like juvenile humor. That's okay. Okay. But bathroom, the, the, bathroom the, I think good. what bugs me, though, is they were on to something brilliant. Right. You know, and there were a couple of brilliant statements in the in the show. And one of them was, you know, they, the, the, the father of the kid who gets kidnapped by Apple goes to the kids and he says, we gotta, we got to get him back. we got to call the police. And the kid's like, call the police? The police call Apple when they want to find someone. <laughs> We're going to call the police. Good line. You know, which is beautiful. You know. Perfect line. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so somebody said in the chat room, but the point is nobody knows what these companies are doing with it. Well, what do you think they're doing? Do you think Apple's collecting 38 million iPhone locations so they can do... <laughs> What? What do they? What do they want to do? They want to follow you around. They're looking in through your window. No, they're selling it to marketers. Everybody knows exactly what they're doing, and it's anonymized in the sense that it's not. I mean, among other things, of course. I think the well, Skyhook database is the other thing. They're building a database of access points for a GPS. But, but nevertheless, I mean, what do you think they're doing with it? They're not. They're not. Um, they're not following you. You'd have to be right. extremely I mean, paranoid game, to think that. Right. The end game of this, from Google's perspective in particular, is going to be to serve you a better ad. You know, yes. So that when you're having dinner in Dedham, that the ad that comes up on your phone when you pay for it electronically will be for a place next door that yeah. sells dessert. Did you really want to you eat know? here because, you know, we had a better steak well, for half the price Right, but door. I mean, that's the end game, right? Of and course. I'm not saying that that's valuable, but it's not necessarily nefarious. Well, yeah, I can't. I mean, if the government wanted that information, I think that's nefarious. Apple or Google wanting it, it's just to make money. That's their job. And if you don't like it, turn it off. You can. Or like, better yet, buy a stupid I mean, phone. Buy a feature phone. Yeah. Take, yeah, really. It's like parenting. Just this, do the job. This it's, is the trade-off. It's yeah, very it's like simple. This, it's not like the thing isn't there with an off switch. I mean, you know, exercise some common sense, please. Yeah. I don't know. I just don't see this as a huge deal. No, I, I agree with you. You're, you're kind of signing up for this whether you know, well, you should know it. But when you get a smartphone, you're signing yeah. up for this. All of those things that the smartphone does, you know, all of this stuff, all of the Google stuff, it's all paid for that way. That's what you, the deal is. Uh, by the is. way, you know, if you had to put stuff in different categories, smart and dumb, knowing where you are, which, which bucket does that fall yeah. into? Is that smart? smart. <laughs> you have a smartphone. That's you have one a smartphone. Seriously. <laughs> get a Motorola yeah. Razor. Not common sense. You want to, you know, you get, know, you get, want to get a pager. I don't care. Get just, a pager. <laughs> you know, stop complaining and just take care of yourself. I think more people change, are just know? kind of thinking, oh, yeah. they must want to know where I am because, and I'm trying to figure out what that fill in the blank would be. I because, love that stuff. Yeah, the conspiracy theorist stuff. You know, yeah. So let's uh, let's as long as we're uh, we're uh, talking yeah. yes. <laughs> about Apple, let's just go all the way. Okay. Uh, you bought a MacBook Air. Shame yeah. on you, Paul Thurot. I did. But you, know, you did it for a good I, reason. Let me tell you something. 
a lot of my interactions with Apple people are not, um, what's the word? Positive. <laughs> positive? Really? Um, yeah. What a shock. But, well, and I shouldn't say Apple people. I mean, they're, they're more like the fanatic guys, right? I mean, those guys, they can't stand it. I have to say that that's an important point. Most Apple people are not that are not the craze. No, and that's increasingly true, right? As the size of that audience grows, it's I mean, if they were, you'd, more they'd be normal. an army. They'd be a horde. Well, no, but they're more normal people now. In other words, the, the percentage of the fanatics is getting smaller and smaller. You know, the, exactly. as the Apple stuff grows, it's just normal people. You know, there aren't that many fanatics out there. I mean, so... Oh, those are just some crazed, weird geeks. Yeah, anyway. Um, I've written uh, two pretty long articles about my experiences and the various pitfalls of um, installing Windows 7 on a MacBook Air. I've discussed the various ways you can go about it, you know, we, uh, virtualization and boot camp and even Windows 7 as the only OS on, on the system. I have installed Windows 7 and actually Mac OS 10 on this laptop so many times now, and I've only had the thing for a week. I mean, it's actually kind of ludicrous. I've done it again and again and again and again. It's, it's interesting. So, so um, where's the problem? What, what's not working? <coughs> well, you know, it's funny. Uh, if you... If you don't pay too much attention, it's okay. It's okay. And I, I think the point, if I were just to make a really general statement about it, it is, if you're a Mac guy, you know, you, you own a Mac, but you have some reason, uh, either a want or a need, whatever it may be, to run Windows, you know, it's possible, right? And there are different ways to do it, and they all have different pros and cons. I, I would put, you know, one guy actually asked me, and I don't understand, like, why would anyone ever want to do this? This is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. And I, you know, to which I had actually a nastier reply than this to him personally because of the way he worded his email. But my sort of general response would simply be, you know, Apple provides something called boot camp. So clearly there is a need. I mean, I, the Apple would not still be doing this and updating it for new versions of Windows if there wasn't a need, you know. So clearly there's a need. Yeah, it's a selling um, point. You know, it's on. It's, it's absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an absolutely viable thing to do. It's fine. Um, if you are a Windows guy and you're going to always be a Windows guy and you kind of look out over the other side of the fence as we do and you look at the hardware, because I think the, the thing that's really exciting on the Apple side is the hardware. You know, it's just so awesome. You know, it's just even though you can point toward you can point me at a, you know, like Samsung laptop, for example, that's almost as thin. The battery life is almost as good. It's, you know, it's just, you know, it's not the same thing. The, the problem is once you look at a MacBook Air, in this case, or some other Mac, as a Windows machine, it's not really ideal, uh, honestly, as that kind of thing. And it's not, it's not any one thing. It's a bunch of little things. So, for example, um, obviously the keyboard is a little off. There are things you can do. You can remap the keys and all that, and you can fix stuff like that. Apple provides very basic drivers for all of the hardware components in every machine, and it works. So you bring the thing up, and device managers clean. Everything's there. But there are little things. So, for example, on an SSD-based system like this, um, the hard drive is not set up in the most, if the hard, you know, the, it's really not a hard drive, but let's call it the hard drive, is not configured in the most efficient man man uh, manner under Windows, meaning you don't get the best performance and you also don't get the best power management. Even though Windows has this capability, it's artificially limited by the drivers that Apple provides uh, themselves. Because so, nobody else makes them, I and mean, you have to get them from Apple. Yeah. Now, again, there are workarounds for different machines. Now, th this particular one, because it has an NVIDIA chipset, I can't actually fix that particular problem for some reason. I guess there's an Intel driver set that you could use on other Macs that don't have uh, NVIDIA drivers. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it goes on and on. But um, there, there's a weirdness with this machine because of the type of... Um, uh, it doesn't have a BIOS. It has this EFI. Right. All the Apple, uh, all the Apple laptops are EFI. Yeah. Now, Windows is compatible actually, all the Apple computers. But... Um, it creates some weirdisms, you know. Right. So on a, if you just ins were to install Windows on this machine, what you would see is, it's, first of all, it's fine. The performance is good. The battery life is good. Um, it boots up pretty quick, not awesome quick. Like uh, on the Windows PCs that I have, you put an SSD in it and it boots up really fast, you know. Um, this one's not like that. There's a, there's a weird thing where you get that Mac bong sound and it sits on that light gray screen and it just sits there. That's the memory check. It sits there. That's the memory check. But it sits there. It sits there longer when it's Windows. And I don't know hmm. why. <laughs> you know? And if you just only have Windows on there, you have to, there's nothing you can do. It just sits there. Hmm. And then it does this. It's almost like, I, and I see this, I've never seen this on a Windows PC, but there's this, there's this moment where you get a black screen with an underscore DOS character, and it blinks a couple of times, and then it loads Windows. It's almost like a little, ha-ha, see this DOS? <laughs> you know? It's, it's like this weird little... 
I think I don't know what it is. I, I don't you know. Think I've Apple's never doing it. that on purpose. I really do. I really do. So what, <laughs> the end result is you get this machine that when you compare like Windows to the Mac side, the Windows version gets uh, good battery life, but not as good as on the Mac. It it goes to sleep a little slower, not uh, instantaneously, but almost you know a second or two. It comes out of sleep after seconds, let's say three or four seconds, not like in a second, you know, um, it will arbitrarily kind of go into a hibernation mode so that if you leave it sitting there closed for a while and open the lid, it actually goes to the boot screen again and then has to resume from there. So it's a longer resume time, that kind of thing. It's not horrible. I mean, it's not horrible. But the problem is, you know, I paid $1,500 for this thing. So um, not horrible for $1,500 is unacceptable in a world where you can buy a, a perfectly awesome Windows laptop for seven, 800 bucks maybe. Um, that would have none of these issues, you know. It won't look as pretty, right? It won't be as light. Um, it won't have that high res of a screen on that size, right? A 13-inch screen with a 1440 by 900 screen is pretty special. Uh, most Windows laptops today still have that, you know, 1366 by 768 screen. And, and so it kind of goes from there. You know, there, there's, uh, I've, I think I've highlighted the, the big things, but there, you know, there are a bunch of little things, you know. Um, I'm okay with it. I mean, I'm fine with it. And I like, I've, I've, I've gone back and forth, like I said, different types of configurations. I think ultimately it makes the most sense on a machine like this for you, you to have both OSs on there, which is tough on a 128 gigabyte drive because there's not a lot of space because you can't do things like upgrade the firmware if you only have Windows on there because you have to do that from the Mac side. So I guess what I'm trying to say is if, if, the, if the Mac is the point and you need a Mac for some reason, but you also need Windows... Uh, perfectly viable. But if you're a Windows guy and you're looking kind of across the fence and you're looking at this thing thinking, oh my God, I really want one of these things. I really want one of these things. Um, just understand that it's not, it's a, it's kind of a, a, a premium machine, but it's not a premium Windows experience. So I just don't think it's a good choice if what you're looking for is a good Windows 7 laptop. Well, good. So I guess Glad I, to get I guess that I, uh, feedback, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, maybe, and maybe a lot of people are thinking, well, what a, what a shocker that a Mac wouldn't be, you know, a premier Windows experience. But, you know, these things are essentially PCs. There's no reason it couldn't be. Uh, the truth is it's artificially limited. I mean, um, if the right drivers were simply available, this thing would be absolutely a premier Windows laptop. It would be fantastic. Yeah, that is, I, th I think that probably is the big issue, is that on, on any normal PC, you can get drivers from Microsoft which yeah. is the default, but you probably also can get drivers from at least the co company that makes the hardware, if not from yeah. a third I've party. I've done lots of hokey things on this. I've tried lots of weird drivers that people have recommended. I've tried utilities that kind of uh, destroy, you know, the x64 version of Windows capability of preventing unsigned drivers from getting on the system, and you do, it, it, it's just awful. So you want um, better drivers, basically. You think? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I look at how it operates on the Mac side, and I, I know from Apple's perspective this makes plenty of sense. You know, if people are doing both on the same machine, they could be like, look, you know, when Mac OS X, it really is better. But I have to, you know... Anna, I don't <laughs> think that's why it's, they're doing it. You think that's why oh, they're I doing do. it? Oh, I do. I absolutely think they're doing it on purpose, yeah. And and by the way, I respect their right to do that. I I, I just think... I think it's again, a mistake, because I think think of all the people they could sell Apple hardware to if it were a better Windows machine. You don't want, but you don't, you don't want them on Windows. You know, I, I think for most, most people who buy this machine in real life, if they're not going all Mac right away are going to have, there's a reason, right? They have to run some app for work or whatever it is. And I think those people might be better served by just using some virtualization environment and running that app side by side with the host environment or whatever. And that's, that's what and I do. You can, uh, but yeah, I do both. Do, yeah. On my, um, on my big PC and my uh, Mac Pro, I have a boot camp install of Windows. But, you know, when you install VMware Fusion, it sees it and says, oh, do you want to use this or your partition? I say, yes. <laughs> on my, yeah. um, on my yeah. MacBook Pro, my high-end i7 MacBook Pro, I do the same thing. And Windows runs nicely. I mean, I, 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 of course, unlike you, I don't run Windows all the time on native Windows machines, so I may not notice the difference. I mean, well, I have and, some Windows and, laptops. And that's fine. Like I said, but that's fine. So if you're running a Mac, um, most often, and occasionally you run Windows. It, it's fine. It's not like you're missing anything. It, right. It's all there. You know, it, it's uh, you know fully functional. And everything. Thirty-two it's, or sixty-four. It, I've done both. Uh, both work fine on it. You you know, I've tried everything, Leo. I'm telling you, if no, there's I a, believe you. If there's a configuration, I've done it. I did exactly what you just described. I installed Fusion on there. Right. I did it both uh, through Boot Camp, and you can bring up just like you said. I've done that. Um, I didn't install Parallels this time, but I have a license for Parallels as well. 
Um, and I've used that in the past too, but um, yeah, I have tried this in every possible. Oh, look, I'm, I'm, I'm a Windows guy. I'm running Windows. You know, this isn't changing. Uh, this, this thing, I don't care how beautiful it is. I'm not going to suddenly start running the Mac OS X. I just don't care about it. But um, I'm not going to run Windows subordinate to Mac OS X either. That doesn't make any sense no. to me. No, you want a native Windows machine. Yeah. And apparently and an Apple is not a good choice. I know. And, and again, this sounds like one of those, duh, you know, like why would... No, why it doesn't would... sound like a duh, actually. I'm, I, I'm it's interesting just to sort of verify that. I mean, it, it's possible... Um, you know, in the future, as EFI gets updated too, I've heard that there's a coming update to that, and if the new Macs support that, or if Apple updates these Macs to support that version of the firmware, that some of the things that I'm complaining about from a driver perspective uh, become less of a problem or whatever, so we'll see. You know, when you install Windows, it looks at the hard drive and determines, you know, what the capabilities are, and I think that's one of the limits, because to when Windows looks at it on a Mac, on this Mac, it sees it as like a PCI-style hard drive, even though that's not what it is, and you don't get the optimal performance, not just raw performance, but also the power management performance. That's a driver issue. You're absolutely right. They should yeah. have a better driver on there. That's interesting. Yeah. But even you, you can go to NVIDIA, you, if you find out exactly the driver chipset, it's like a 320M or whatever it is, you go to NVIDIA's website, you look up the exact driver, you download it, and you install it. It says, no, this is an unsupported system. It won't even do it, <laughs> you know. Um, that's not how PCs work, you know, so it's a little weird. Uh, well, okay. Yeah, there you go. I, I'm, I'm glad to get the feedback. I was curious. In fact, I was a little concerned, to be honest. A little concerned. <laughs> when you said, I'm going to buy a MacBook Air for Windows, I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, this is a fun experiment. Like I, but like I said, I, I've gotten so much interesting feedback from this. I've had a, a, a really good set of exchanges with people. I, I was really surprised by how jazzed a lot of people were by this topic. Um, and, and look, I, I've always had at least one Mac here, you know, for over a decade now. Um, this is something I'll always do. Um, it's important for me to keep up with what's going on on the other side. So um, it's not, you know, it's no big deal. I mean, I just, this is just part of what I do. It's fine. But Windows 7 user in our chat room asks a question I'd like to know the answer <laughs> to, too. What was the Windows user experience uh, rating? Yes, 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 yes. Actually, I will look. Um, it's pretty good. So I need to log in, but it, it, uh, you know, there's something interesting about that. When you have an SSD on Windows, I think that you, what you're looking for on the hard drive score is a score of at least seven. Yeah, I get and a, I get a six four total on my i7 MacBook Pro 2011 MacBook Pro. Is it? But I think SSD? the hard drive is. You're right. It's the top of the. It's as, as high as it gets. Yeah. So my I, the way I recall it, I'm looking now, but it wasn't quite seven. It, or uh, it was like six point nine, I think. So the overall score is 5.3, but the 5.3 is the processor, which, remember, is a Core 2 Duo, and also the graphics uh, for desktop performance. But the gaming graphics, interestingly, are 6. Uh, the memory is 5.7, but the primary hard disk, and remember, this is the thing on, um, uh, on an SSD should be at least 7, is 6.9. Oh, yeah, there's a problem. You're right. It's so when I look at my issue. desktop, by the way, so my desktop computer, which also has an SSD, uh, running Windows, obviously, the, the score on that machine is 7.7. 7. That's a significant difference. In fact, yeah. everything is over 7 on this computer, except for the graphics card, which I don't really care about, which is 6.2. Um, that's a desktop computer, but anyway. Um, yeah, so it's a little lower. You know, you would think this thing would be 7, 7 something, you know. And it's not, especially since it's not a, uh, it's not even a, it's not even a, a you know, a solid state in in a in a pass through. It's like it's it's right on the motherboard, essentially, yeah. or plugged into the motherboard. Yeah, I actually you, upgraded you think, mine, and it is. It looks like a little. Um, ram it's a stick, like stick. a little ram stick. Like Except a, the connectors on the t on the side instead of the. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I put a two. I put a two forty in. No, it's, it's easy. This is the OWC thing, right? Yes. Um, I thought about that. It's expensive, but it was like six hundred bucks, wasn't it? Well, it depends how much uh, you want to put in. It's five hundred for uh, one twenty eight. I put a two forty in. It was almost yeah. It's virtually six hundred bucks. And then uh, they send you the two Torx screwdrivers you need. So you remove the screws on the bottom of the air. And then it opens up, and it's all right there laid out before you. Nothing's attached. It's so very there, simple. Two, so it's a, it's a simple thing to do. I put, uh, they yeah. uh, Justin Random Geek says it's a PCI Express mini card, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> which is kind of interesting, running SATA over the connector. But I put the other world 240 in. I have to say, I mean, I, it's kind of silly, because I was, I was doing just fine with, with the, the 64 gig well, but 64 is nothing. Well, to do what you want to do, if I, and that was what I, I, I couldn't run Windows and Boot Camp on it because I didn't have enough room to do that. So that's yeah. why I want to put a bigger one in. It's 
And I, 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 but see, I'm, I'm, I'm not running Windows on it. It's fine for Macintosh. It's fast. It boots fast. I, I understand. It's, it is fine for the Macintosh. It's, it's very yeah, good. Sure. It's very good for the Mac. I, yeah. There's a, there's kind of a, a synthesis of uh, software yeah, and hardware. It just seems to work. Yeah. <laughs> together so well. It just works. Yeah. <laughs> they should coin that as a term. <laughs> Uh, so I would say window, Mac plus Windows, it, it basically kind of works. You know, yeah, it works. Yeah. It works. I would it say works. it just works. It works. It works. It works. <laughs> it works. It works. Well, it works. Uh, hey, way, again, I did not not to be dead. I just wanted you know to finalize the thought. I, when you spend fifteen hundred bucks on something, uh, it should be better than that. I agree. I think it's the point. So you know, there are high end PCs. I mean, feel free to go nuts on one of those. We're gonna take a break. Come back with more. There is a lot more to talk about. More gates. We got CloudGate, Sony uh, Gate, more gates. Windows Home Server Gate, the Back Gate. But first, Installation <laughs> Gate, Twitter Gate. <laughs> <laughs> but first, let's talk a little bit about Go to Assist Express from our good friends at Citrix. They are such a great supporter of all of our shows uh, and have been for many years. We love them, and I think uh, if you haven't tried Go to Assist Express and you're in the support biz, this would be a great thing for you to know about. Uh, there are many, uh, you know, support solutions. There's even free support solutions. I won't deny that out there. Uh, program, I, well, I won't say their name. Well, I'll say their names. Programs like TeamViewer, LogMe, and that kind of thing. But nothing is as good, as fast, as easy to use, and as tuned for support as Go to Assist Express. First of all, it's the fastest out there because of their proprietary algorithms that really give them great speed even over slower networks it's also designed for the support professional so for instance you're going to support somebody uh, you send them a link they click the link automatically the only thing second link they have to click is they'll have to it's a java based applet so they'll have to click an allow or you know trust this applet and then 30 seconds later it's installed this happens every time by the way so you're always going to be using the latest version of go to assist express i like that you know, the updates to security, it's always uh, uh, up to date. Now, they can see you working on their computer. You can chat with them. But they can also give you unattended access permission, which means that in future, if their system's on, you just go in there and fix it. You can run eight sessions at once, so that means you don't have to wait for a session to finish, a scan or an update to finish before you go on to the next session. That's really great. In fact, people who use GoToAssist Express say they're getting about 40% more productivity, two more days a week, in effect. Uh, just the greatest way. You can share your screen back with your client so they can see what it's supposed to look like, for instance. Um, complete diagnostics, including what operating system programs that are running, what security software's in the background, that kind of thing. It is really great. But the, here's the best deal. It is free for the next 30 days. Just try it. Go to assist.com slash windows. They have month passes and day passes. So if you don't do this all the time, you can get a day pass. But I think if you're in the business... This is the tool you have to have, and, uh, and it's going to be so useful to you. Go to assist.com slash windows. Try them all. Try them all. I know. I have confidence that this is the one you'll want. Go to assist.com slash windows. And we just love Citrix. We thank them so much for uh, supporting all of our shows and most especially Windows Weekly. In fact, that's what we'd like you very much to say, Windows, when you go there, to all of our uh, all of our advertisers, so that they know that Paul Therott made you do it. I heard from another cake winner. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. I could have signed up for this service so I could win a cake. <laughs> That's the FreshBooks thing. Is that yeah. a conflict of interest? I don't know. No. In fact, you should say, I'm Paul Therott. Send me a cake. Send me a damn cake. <laughs> I can't eat cake. I'm on a low-carb diet, Leo. I would like to. Yeah, well, that's the problem. I get cakes and I can't eat them. It's yeah. so hard. How's that going for you? I've actually plateaued the last couple of weeks, yeah, so I'm going to have to figure something out. But you and I out. just look so good. I don't I think just, there's I a just problem. naturally look great, so it doesn't matter. But right. No, I really, I, I'd like it just to kind of continue, to be honest. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to the gym. That's my... <sighs> I did my Pilates this morning. Love it. And when they invent a carb-free cake, please let us know. Oh, yeah. It'll be made you out know, of meat. It'll be a bacon cake. A meat cake. <laughs> <laughs> meat cake. <laughs> cake. So uh, this is oh my god territory here. We're talking this is about crazy. Yeah. Oh my god, Sony PSN. We talked about it on Security Now yesterday, and yeah. you can imagine Steve's uh, just uh, incredulousness about how poorly Sony's handled this and how what a t what this the nightmare that this is. <laughs> I got an email. I just got it's, an, cra it's crazy. I got the email too. So. Yeah, from PSN saying. Yeah, you're screwed is what it says. We don't know it says if we lost about 3,000 words. But yeah, we don't know if we lost your credit card data, but... So 
There is some late breaking news that suggests the credit card data is not stolen. Oh God, I hope so. Uh, but I, 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 I don't even know if this. I gave him a credit card. It would have been years ago, and I can't get on PSN to find out. So, it, yeah, in my in my case, uh, when the PS3 came out, I bought one on day one, and of course, I signed on to the service. Sure. So did I. And I bought some little games. Yep. You know, as so you would to it. test it. Yep. So they had my credit card. Yep. But that was what years was that? ago? Three, four years ago? I don't yeah. Know, three years ago, three and a half years so ago. I have no idea what my login is or any of this. But interestingly, since then, I actually had given the PS3 to a friend for his kids. And then late last year, I bought another one because I was doing a series of uh, articles on set-top boxes. And I signed on with a new account. Now, on this account, I did not... I've never bought anything on, on PSN. So I may not have given them my credit card information. I'm not sure how that works. I did tell my wife to keep an eye on our on a debit card, which is what I probably would have used. But I don't know. But, you know, you know, talk about inept. I mean, when, when you, uh, <laughs> you know, when you think about the different ways you can respond to a crisis, you know, um, staring wide-eyed at the oncoming car is not necessarily the, the best of responses. It's, yeah. So I guess. <laughs> like a deer you know, in the headlights. <clears throat> yeah, there was a. A single hacker, apparently, that broke into their account and into their service. This service has, this is amazing to me. Uh, I think it has 77 million oh. subscribers. Oh, my God. It, uh, 42 million of which are actually on the PlayStation Network. The other 30 or whatever that works out to be million are people who are, uh, who own Sony Bravia TVs and they access, um, you know, online uh, yeah, music there's a, and, and, yeah. and video There's a whole bunch of other Sony stuff, so that's included yeah. too. Yeah, so it's almost half-half. But um, this is, actually, you know, the, even the 42 million number is bigger than the, the number of people who subscribe to Xbox Live, by the way. So that's actually pretty impressive um, and confusing. But, okay. Anyway, they've got tens of millions of people. And all of these people have accounts where you have your name and your address and your phone number and whatever else, and a credit card number and your expiration date and all that kind of stuff. And apparently this guy, person, I believe it was a single person, they believe it was a single person, um, had hacked the network. They shut it down. They never explained to anyone what was going on. No one could get online to play games. A week went by, and they almost a week, they brought in an outside security firm because they couldn't figure it out. And these guys said, yeah, you got hacked. They stole all your information. Oh. And that, <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, and then they finally alerted people. Now, I believe as of now, I haven't checked uh, today actually, but I believe it's still offline. They're going to have to re-architect this thing in many ways before they can bring it online again. It's a huge problem. Now, the, the little bit I just heard before we started the show was that according to Sony, the customer data was not encrypted on their hard drives, but the credit card data was. So it's possible that even if they got this information, they wouldn't be able to use it. The other thing to remember, and this doesn't really fully solve the problem, but apparently the credit card data that's on there includes the, the credit card number and then the expiration date, but not that three or four-digit code, you know, the additional oh, okay. code. Uh, that's not actually required for all purchases, but I guess, I, and again, I haven't used PSN lately, but I assume the way it works is when you go to make the purchase, they make you put in that number, even if it's storing your credit card number so they can assure that you are who you say you are. Um, so, you know, there's some hope left, but um, it's, it's just amazing. I mean, it's, this is so improbably dumb. I, I don't even know how to explain. They're so inept in their handling of this event. It, it's just mind boggling. Um, I, I, I'm just, I'm blown away by it. Yeah. And it's, it's ongoing. I mean, yeah. it's, it's just, it still hasn't resolved itself. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. I, I can't think of anything ever <laughs> anywhere like this. No, it's nuts. And by the way, you know, when I, when I speak of faux outrage over this, um, you know, this uh, location gate thing, right? Whether you're talking about Apple or Google or Microsoft and you know, these people are all up in arms. To me, that's a complete baloney event in that, no one needs to be all excited about this. This ain't this. no baloney event. No, no, no. This is this is unbelievably serious. I mean, this is I, this is like 
Oh yeah, we had the uh, we had the hard drive out in the car and left the doors open, and uh, I guess someone just took it, and that's like all our PSN account information. Like, yeah. What you, Whoops. You, like Bob's. Oops. <laughs> gaming service over like in the corner mall or something like what? This is well, like so. And, and as Steve Gibson points out, that it's it's unconscionable in this day and age to store passwords uh, unhashed in the clear in a database sure. ever. There's just sure. no there's no reason to do it. Uh, there's no technical reason to do it. It's just stupidity. <laughs> They're probably using like a DBase three plus pat, you know database or something. I think that. it was a MySQL or an SQL it's database. A, it's just, yeah, uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, unhashed I, passwords. No, there's no reason ever for that to happen. Classic. Oh, that's just classic. Sorry. So I don't think we've heard the end of this one. I think oh, this is going to go on for a while. But you know, I, 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 <laughs> the one thing I'd say is you know this is clearly the worst thing that's ever happened to the Sony PlayStation. Uh, th you know three. Um, other than the initial price of the machine when it came out. Um, when Microsoft suffered through that warranty issue, uh, the $1.1 billion you know, problem they had with the hardware, um, you know, they got through that, didn't they? Because people, even though they'll complain about it, love the Xbox 360. They just love it. And, and, they'll, and they're willing to give Microsoft a pass on this thing in a way that they just don't do for other Microsoft products. It's the same pass that Apple gets on virtually everything from their own customers. It's people love this thing. Um, I have to think this is going to do it for a lot of PS3 guys. I think this is going to make them say like enough, because when you you know when you talk about something like this, this is very this is really serious. You know, um, Steve. Steve believes. No analog. Steve believes. Given, I mean, he started a new section about uh, three or four weeks ago called uh, uh, break-ins and uh, you know to cover <laughs> yeah. these things, right? And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, breaches, I think he calls it, and uh, he believes that this is the this is the peak. This yeah. is we are. It will get this better. Is the wake up call for the industry because kind of the thing. whole industry is going to go. Oh crap! <laughs> well, yeah, I, I talked about the early days of XP, and Microsoft had their epiphany moment yeah. where they said everything we're doing is insecure. We need to fix this now, and they came up with this whole trustworthy computing initiative. They came up with the secure development life cycle for all of the software. They felt so strongly about this that they have preached it to their partners and competitors and have told them, you need to do this too. This is really serious. And one of the things you, you, you will remember is that that has occurred on Windows over the past decade is the vulnerabilities, the really bad ones, have moved from the OS to the applications. In many ways, third-party applications like Adobe applications are the famous ones right now. And it's specifically because those companies ignored this advice. You know? So... I think, you know, for so obviously for Sony, this is that moment. But I would hope, as I did then, I suppose, that people would look at this and learn the lesson, you know, learn from the failures of others to do the right things in their own products. It's amazing. It's a really serious event. So, again, I have a feeling we'll be talking about this again next week. I'm curious to see what happens next. <laughs> Besides, but, you know, Sony is also not notorious for uh, falling on their sword and... And being honest and apologizing and things like that. They remember they they put a root kit on people's computer as DRM a few years right. back. Remember that? Uh, I, they don't okay. have the best record in this. Uh, this is the company that handed the you know portable music market to Apple on a silver platter too. Right. Uh, sure. So there you go. Uh, speaking of <laughs> breaches and outages, uh, is EC2 back? I don't even know if it's back. It's out for it so is, long. Yeah. The weird thing is I was in Vegas last week again, and one of the guys who was there at our show was from Amazon. He did one of the keynote addresses, and I was talking to him briefly at a, uh, a party or whatever, and I said, you know, I said, one of the things I really love about Amazon is, A, I mean, you guys are just like this huge platform ecosystem player now. It's amazing. But I said, you never hear any stories about you guys going down. Like, you're always like, you know, you just, you're so, compared to all these other companies, like Microsoft, whatever, you know, these guys that offer storage, you guys are just, you're always up. And I think it was like 24 hours later, this happened, and I was thinking to myself, I have to stop saying stuff like that to people, you know. <laughs> it's just uh, bad karma there. But, you know, people overreact to things. Uh, they've overreacted to this just like they overreacted to the location gate stuff. And um, I, I've seen some more um, knowledgeable people pull that Superman quote that I put in the notes, which is, you know, even given this experience, this is still safer and more reliable than hosting it yourself. True. 
And uh, this is one of those things we need to remember. Well, um, this, again, this was bad. In the scope of Amazon stuff, this yeah, was bad. Because you expect them to be up 100%. You literally you do because they yeah, pretty much they're Amazon. Yeah. Steve Gibson, uh, uh, to quote him again, uh, moved a bunch of his uh, file serving for uh, his website to <laughs> S3, Amazon's S3. I said, Steve, interesting timing. <laughs> he said, but I mean, we pointed out, but it's still going to be better than anything you could do. So, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, how exciting. <laughs> it really wouldn't be a show without a mention of Windows Home Server. Wow. I'll try to take that without the sarcasm with He's, which it was intended. He And now our Windows but, Home Secretary, Mr. Walter. <laughs> <laughs> um, without recapping all of the issues with the latest version of Windows Home Server, um, I had been running the beta, and I, I want to say back in March, I had to, on a very quick emergency basis, uh, migrate all of the data, uh, 2.6 terabytes worth of data, uh, from that machine to the same machine, running the RC version because the final version hadn't come out yet. To accomplish this, I, I purchased a uh, three, yes, a three terabyte external hard drive, USB three. Um, it took the better, actually, it took the better part of two days because at the time I was doing it over USB two, and you know I wiped out the machine, put on the RC version of uh, Home Server, and and moved from there. Now the reason that was necessity or it was necessary was because. The beta version of Home Server, remember, had that drive extender stuff on it. So you had, it had data uh, duplication. Whereas the final, the RC version and now the final version do not. So I, it wasn't a simple, uh, there was no simple way to just swap, uh, you know, replace the OS and, sw you know, just repoint things at the data. Because the data on those drives is unreadable now by the RC and the RTM version. But now that I've done that upgrade... Um, the final version of Home Server 2011 has come out. So upgrading from the RC version to RTM, and I would imagine going forward to future versions, is actually very easy because when you run the setup application, it looks at your disks and it says, well, this looks like the primary disk. We're going to wipe this thing out, you know, wipe out the OS, reinstall, but it doesn't touch any of the data. So I actually did back it up, obviously, right, just in case. So 2.6 terabytes of data over USB 3.0, uh, so instead of taking two full days, it took about uh, the better part of the afternoon. It took a long time, several hours. But then, you know, wiping out the OS and, you know, moving everything over again, it was really easy. I didn't have to copy the data back. It was already on the drives. Just pointed the folders around and it all worked. So I've written it up, you know, uh, uh, the process. But it was, um, it was a really seamless cool. process. And, like, I, it was, like, the easiest upgrade ever. I mean, uh, I was talking to Rafael Rivera and I was comparing... This process was all the Windows Phone silliness. And I was thinking to myself, I mean, this is like the, you know, the, the opposite ends of the spectrum. I mean, how awesome the Windows Home Server stuff worked. The other thing that I mentioned previously that I was going to work on some kind of a cloud backup plan for Home Server. And I've actually gone with Crash Plan. Um, and the reason there is they support Windows Home Server, which is pretty rare for a service where they're not charging you a lot more because it's, you know, a server. And because it's so cheap. You know, I, I think the one year of unlimited storage for one computer was somewhere in the $50 range. And um, and once you turn off the little limiters they have in the UI, it, it you know, it's going to take a week or more to upload, you know, the data. Um, it's not the full one. It's not the full 2.6. A lot of that's videos. So it's it's under a terabyte. It's, it's actually, it's probably closer to 500 gigabytes somewhere there. Um, that seems to be working well. So, you know, overall, I, I you know, um, now that this thing's on there, I want to do, I'll probably, you know, I'll review it and I'll, I'll do some feature focused stuff on uh, home server. But, you know, compared to that awful last second spaz from the beta to the RC, this, this thing was, it was just very, very easy. It was nice. Still with me? Yeah. <laughs> I just, you know, whenever you talk about home server, I just kind of yeah. drift off. Cause I should use the hypnotist voice. <laughs> you are getting sleepy. <clears throat> there was a guy like that at Mix uh, when they did the the Worldwide Telescope demo. You know, he says, and now we're going to move on to the moons of Saturn. <laughs> I always fall asleep in planetariums, actually. I don't know. Oh, that's funny. I, every time famous for yeah. this. It's great. Well, you're sitting in a My chair. wife just told me they, they completely redid the planetarium at the Museum of Science in Boston. She's like, if you need to get some sleep, we should head over this on Friday night. <laughs> great for a nap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I've, every time. I've never not gone to a, uh, a planetarium and not, I've never gone to one and not fallen asleep. 
Never. It's great, though. It's soothing. It's relaxing. And, you know, it's because yeah, you're around me. I snore like a bastard. Can you imagine what that must be like? <laughs> and now we're going to the rings. And... <laughs> the guy next to you. Really? But they always get a guy <laughs> with a very soothing voice. Yeah. He's talking like that. I want, I've always wanted that Starfield thing in my bedroom, you know. The planetarium. Oh, wouldn't that be ceiling. cool? Oh, awesome yeah, if I'm ever be. rich, I'm buying a whole little one of the, you know those planetarium devices that they have. Yeah, you just sleep under a dome, you know, <laughs> and a chair and some yeah. astronomer. I'll, I'll I'll pay an astronomer just to go <laughs> talk. Pay some guy a lot of money. Hey, I'd like to go to bed. You think he could uh, just talk to me for about fifteen minutes? There's somebody in the chat room says he always falls asleep during this show. Yeah. Hey, 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 knock it off. Um, there's going to be finally uh, Windows. Phone on CDMA. I, I, when did when did this well, happen? They're on Sprint now. So CDMA, oh, they are on Sprint. Oh, okay, but, okay. So. But this Verizon thing, you know, uh, we've known they were coming forever. Uh, it was going to be January. It's going to be February. It's going to be March. Because I'm, you know, this is perfect. Yeah, I'm ready because I have a, I, uh, you know, I don't have a phone on Verizon. I have an account. You know, it's right. funny. Even if you don't have a phone, they keep oh, billing you. Really? <laughs> well, that's a great feature. <laughs> Even if you never use the phone, it still costs like 90 bucks a month. Huh. Ha! Huh. Well, uh, hopefully in the next 30 days. I mean, I can't make any guarantees because, you know, it's been a while. But I, I, And I mean, over a month ago, maybe a month and a half, I started getting emails from Verizon employees because, you know, before these things hit the store, they send out demo units with, that have demo uh, materials, you know, things that they put on the wall or on a stand or whatever. And these things went out, and a bunch of people emailed me and took pictures of it, and here it is, and it's going to be any day now. This Usually when we get these things in the stores, it, the, the release is within two weeks, and a month or six weeks later or eight weeks, whatever it's been, still nothing. But mm. now finally, uh, there's a Verizon support page up now for Windows Phone, and the HTC Trophy, which is the device, uh, I haven't seen this one personally, but I apparently the name. appeared on the uh, Best Buy website as well. So should be happening soon it's basically it's it, there's nothing new or exciting about it from the perspective of existing windows phones right it's it's a you know your standard windows phone device from a i guess their hardware that's specs. one thing that microsoft has done is really kind of standardized the hardware yeah so but it isn't it runs the press and so yeah so yeah, I, mean, I mean i still have that samsung focus i think uh, tony i think tony's using it tony wang is using it okay but that's on uh on uh, AT and T. AT and T. I, I yeah. for some reason I blanked that name out. I wish I wish I could too. Um, the AT and T started rolling out the Nodo update for the final Windows Phone that they sell. The um, which one is that? The LG Quantum. Is that right? Whichever the other one was. Yeah, right. I think it's the LG Quantum. So presumably uh -huh. this would ship with Nodo, right? I mean, this is it does. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Finally, before our picks and tips, a uh, new Mac pack. Or Call of Duty Black Ops. Oh, am I excited. Every time I try to get away from this game, they keep pulling, keep pulling me back in. Now, is it, are we going to get more prestige? No, I think it's just new maps. Just new maps. New zombies, some kind of new zombie thing. It's going to be hey, awesome. Later. Zombies are always good. They had zombies in the last one, didn't they? Yeah, there's always some zombie thing going on. These yeah. guys started this a uh, couple of years ago with World at War, I think. Yeah, yeah. Love yep. those zombies. Yeah. Anyway, they move slow, but they are relentless. <coughs> yes. It's coming out on Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. 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 It won't hey. be available on Tuesday. Let me tell you why. <laughs> you know, uh, Henry, one of the reasons Henry wanted to play Portal 2 with me is because yeah. he said, well, all these kids called in sick to school, and I just was wondering why. <laughs> and then he played it for a little bit. He said, I now I understand why. It's, it really is neat. I was, there's an ad, you know, they have the ads on TV with the two little robots. And I was, I, my wife and I were watching TV and this came on. I said, well, let, let's watch this ad for a minute and tell me what you think about this. And she's like, yeah, you know, I don't know. And I said, let me tell you something about this game. You would actually really <laughs> like it and you're not a game player. And I don't understand why they use these robots in the ads because the protagonist in this game is actually a woman. Right. And that, I think that, that would kind help of bummed Henry out a little bit, believe it or not. He said, I'm yep. a chick? Sure. Well, it, it, that's one of those things in the original Portal. It takes a little while to figure right. that out. Right. And it's like, wow. But, and, she, and she looks a little bit like one of the main characters in Half-Life 2, which is kind of an interesting pseudo-crossover between the games. Well, it is the Half-Life engine, and it's very Half-Life-y if you really 
you know. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Hey, let's take a break. When we come back, we've got our tips and tricks and software of the week. But first, a word. I've got a tip for you. It's time to get a website for crying out loud. Are you, are you wandering through life without a website? Perhaps you say, but Leo, I have a Facebook page. I have a Twitter account. I'm on Flickr. That's n that, no, no, that's not a web page. You need to have a web page that you control all to yourself. Just ask Dana Boyd. You know, she has a Tumblr account. Uh, her, uh, Dana is, of course, famous Harvard researcher, brilliant blogger. Uh, and she's been using the name Zephoria for years. And Tumblr just, they killed it. <laughs> Because somebody said, oh, I got a trademark for that. That's why you have to have your own site. And what better way to set up your own website than Squarespace.com, the secret behind exceptional websites. It's both hosting and software. So, you know, if you're running on another web host and you installed your own software, hey, bully for you, I'm glad you can do it, but this is so much easier. You sign up for the Squarespace account, boom, you're done. You've got it both. And integration with your Flickr account, your Facebook page, your Twitter account makes it very easy to include all of that. Great photo galleries, by the way, so you can build in a slideshow straight from Flickr or put on your own pictures, Twitter. And you see, by the way, the way these widgets work, sliders, point and click, completely easy to do. You don't have to be an expert in anything, including JavaScript or CSS. Now, if you know CSS and JavaScript, well, there's nothing. The sky's the limit because you can use those. So Squarespace really is very powerful in that respect. A great iPhone and iPad app for both blogging and, or posting, I should say, because it's not just blogs, for posting and moderating comments, stats. It will import from your existing page if you're using any one of the traditional APIs like Blogger or TypePad or WordPress or Movable Type. Import and export. It goes both ways, kids. So you're never stuck. This is, this is what you should do. Go to squarespace.com slash windows. And please do go to that special URL so that they say, oh, yes, Paul's sending us lots of business. Squarespace.com slash windows. When you, uh, when you click that green button, try it free, you'll get two weeks of all of the Squarespace features free. You don't even need a credit card. No personal information, just their email so they can tell you when the time's up. They're not going to use it for anything else. And, man, you're going to just be blown away by these great templates that don't look like templates, by the forms, the forums, all the power of Squarespace. Squarespace.com slash Windows. And if you already have a website, but maybe your friends and family don't, don't really understand the need for it, this is a great way to set one up for them and then just hand them the keys. Say, look what I made for you. Merry Christmas. Squarespace.com slash Windows. Give them a try, and we thank them so much for their support for Windows Weekly. And it's now, ladies and gentlemen, time for the picks and tips, or ticks and pips, with Mr. Paul Thorat. Hey, hey, Paul, where are you? Did I push a button? Did you mute yourself? I, I did that. Ah. Sorry. I yeah. didn't want to hack you were hacking. your Squarespace. Yeah, poor guy. Well, we're almost Sorry. done, Paul. Then you can go to bed and play Call of Duty for the rest of your life. <laughs> Actually, the earnings call is in 15 minutes. We should just yeah. stay on. Okay. I will do that. <laughs> no, 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 no. I won't do that to you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. All right, so... <laughs> They're going to make a lot of money, folks. Yeah, I think... Right, right. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see if there are any specifics, right? Will they say how many Windows phone licenses yes. they sold? Yeah, well, that would be great. It'd be interesting to see what... I mean, Is it meaningful like, if they don't? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. All right. So the Windows Weekly Tip of the Week, such as it is, is uh, about Office 2007 and 2010, uh, 2010 more specifically, where, of course, they've replaced the old toolbar and menu UI with the ribbon. And for a lot of people, this is off-putting, although as a longtime ribbon user and fan, I can tell you that this is a vastly superior UI for this kind of application, you know, for productivity-type applications. Um, but the question is, you know, if you've mastered one of these old UIs, I mean, how do you, you know, find out where stuff is? So there are actually a couple ways. There are actually there are a number of ways. These are just two of them. Um, one is uh, this was recommended to me by Mark Evans. There's a a search commands add-in for Office 2007 and 2007, which adds a new tab to the ribbon in all of the main productivity applications in Office, where if you know the name of a command, you can type it into the uh, search box, and then it will show you where it is in the UI, so you can find things that way. 
Um, the other slightly more fun way to do it is through a new version of the game Ribbon Hero, which you can also download, uh, which also includes a, a bit of a, an add-in to Office applications. And basically, this is a kind of a fun game. They've, they've um, added Clippy into it, um, you know, where Clippy is now trying to find oh, a new funny. job because he's not required in Office anymore. <laughs> I love but it. It's actually, you know, it's, it's more fun than it sounds. I almost said funner, which I kind of wish was a word. But it, um, <laughs> it basically teaches you how to use Office in the context of a game. And it's really worth checking out. It's at ribbonhero.com. Um, it's a neat little. It's a, it's a, it's 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 pretty cool. Definitely worth checking out. And you uh, you sort of get points for doing things in Office, but you learn also how to use the features of Office in the process. It's cool. Uh, definitely something worth checking. So kind of fun fun ways to uh, learn more about Office. Essentially, a great thing. Everybody should learn more about Office. I agree, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> I agree so much. I. Jack my head for I, it. I just like <laughs> hit the, the microphone. I just button. like the name Ribbon Hero. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of cool, and I like the yeah. web page too. It's pretty. Yep. Clippy's second chance. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's like an office product demo in that there's a kind of a convoluted series of events that are all right uh, put on top of each other. It's fun that Microsoft can laugh at Clippy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've kind of been milking the Clippy thing for a while, but yes, yes. Why not? Why not? Just don't mention Bob. They get very sensitive about that. <laughs> well, Clippy actually was the successor to Bob, right? right. It was the same thing. It was an avatar. Right. Um, and it's in okay. In fact, they were, they were, remember, Clippy was just one of those avatars. There were little avatars in, in Office that were very similar to the ones that were in Bob. Like the also, little search uh, dog. I was going to say Windows XP had that horrible search dog, which I never understood. <laughs> And then, him, I, we must and have then, talked about this. My biggest pet peeve ever in, in XP, one of the first things I would always do in XP was get rid of the dog. And the way you would do it is there was an, a setting where you could say, I don't want this, I want advanced search. And then the dog would kind of go, Ooh, and then he would like walk off into the distance. So I just told you I don't want you there. And now I have to sit and watch you leave. Watch you leave. Oh. Depressed. That is that is ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. That's <sighs> 10 years ago. It still bothers me. Yeah, me too. It's so funny. So for our apps, we're going to talk about using Twitter on Windows Phone 7. On everything, yeah. On on everything. everything. So all, all the software picks of Twitter this week. Um, yeah, I started using Twitter again. I, I Largely because I just went to two events back to back. And what I noticed was everybody, everybody was using Twitter. Everybody. And when I got back, for, you know, this doesn't surprise me. You go to an industry event. Actually, let me back up a bit. I went to a Boston Celtics basketball game uh, the week before the first of these trips. And we sit the, where our tickets are is right next to where all the, the press people sit, you know, the sports writers and so forth. So they're kind of down in front of us a little bit. And you can look down and you can see the screens of all their laptops and the machines. That's and I'm kind telling of fun. you, yeah, it's interesting. Are they playing at solitaire? No, they're, no, listen, at least, well, it's funny that one of the older guys who writes for the Globe has been around since, uh, you know, probably World War I. Uh, Bob Ryan, uh, we've seen him there a lot. He writes on, with a pen on a pad of paper. Wow. I don't mean like an electronic pen of any no, kind. No. I mean like, yeah, yeah he's like old school. Yeah. He probably still has a secretary that types in stuff. I don't know. He calls Anyway. The, he goes, get me to the copy desk. Yeah. It's, I it, want a file. Really, right. He has a little thing on his head. Yeah. yeah. It, it really is like that. But for the other guys, you know, for most of the guys, I would say at least 50% of those screens had like a Twitter client. Full screen, and and I noticed this at uh, when I the following week I went to mix and a lot of the younger guys especially but not just the younger guys almost everybody you sit in the press room or you sit at the keynote and they all have their laptops on and it's like this panorama of Twitter clients all of them full screen multi column these people are they're like mesmerized by this uh, to me Twitter is like watching performance monitor in Windows you know it's like a it's like a, I don't know how you would sit there and watch it happening in real time, but they do this, you know. And I asked a few people about it. And, and because I, I obviously, I, I use Twitter in some ways, but I don't use it interactively a lot. I, I did for a period of time, and then I didn't, you know. So when I went to the second show, um, different group of guys, a lot of guys I work with, the guys at my own company. And I said, yeah, I just went to the show, and everyone was using Twitter, and I thought that was kind of weird. And 
they're all looking at me like, and I'm like, what? And they said, every one of them uses Twitter. They're you know? tweeting, sure. They're so, tweeting the play, but play by play. So I thought I need to get back on the horse. You know, you don't, you're not, but you will. I have, I already have. I've been doing it for the past two weeks. Good man. Yeah. <laughs> Interacting. And He's stuff. on the tweet horse. Well, I, you know, obviously I get a lot of email, so there's that. Is it at Therat? I think it is, right? It's Therat, yeah. <clears throat> so I, excuse me again, I'm sorry. Um, obviously I get a lot of email, so there's that kind of interaction. Um, I try to publish some of it to the website because that gets it out to more people. You can have interactions with people on Twitter, so I think that's good. I do the personal stuff on Facebook. I, you know, I think that makes sense. You should. This is uh... oh, I do. Yeah, so I've been looking at different clients. My, my, re my requirements for a Twitter client are probably different from a lot of people's, you know. Um, I find a lot of Twitter to be noise. Yes. And I try, I, I, and I want, a lot of these clients are like um, what aircraft carrier control rooms must be like. There's all these weird little switches and, and, and I just don't like busy applications. So it, it took me a while, you know, to settle into clients that I thought made sense. So these are kind of the recommendations I have. I know when I say these, people are going to come back and say, no, 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 you got to use this, you got to use that. And I know you, I, I'm just throwing out the ones that I like, you know. And, You're um, following 36,000 people? I auto-follow, so. Oh, well, no wonder you got a lot of noise. Yeah, it's a lot of noise. Don't, why do you auto-follow? I'm an idiot, Leo. I don't know. I, I think, actually. Randy's you know sitting here nodding. <laughs> to the, to the, I'm an idiot. Yeah. No, the reason is, uh, well, it, certainly uh, there's just some rationale behind you gotta, it. You got to pare it down, I think. Well, in the early days, when I, when I first got on Twitter, I would just post stuff to Twitter. I would write stuff on Twitter. Right. And somebody, uh, and not someone I've ever met personally, but somebody came to me and said, you know, Paul, you don't understand. This is supposed to be interactive. You need to follow people. Oh, please. For this to make sense. This, is, this was years ago. And I said, okay, so how, how, how do I do that, you know? Um, and I think I, I said, I don't remember how I did it, actually, but I set up an autofollow, so now it, things come in automatically. So you don't need to autofollow somebody to interact. You need to read no, the course, mentions. but you need to, exactly. And this is me not, this is, not this is me being lazy, Leo. So I can't explain my actions of the past, but <laughs> that, that's... And now you don't know how to that, turn it off, do you? That's what happened, yeah. So yeah. I'll get to it. It's okay. So I always anyway. look at what people say to me, and then uh, I ignore the, I ignore the <laughs> yes, mean uh, and, uh, and spiteful and bitter comments, and then after that, I'm done. I, right. I, actually, I have to say, my biggest problem with Twitter is the same problem I have with, G, uh, I'm sorry, with Facebook, which is that they have a messaging thing that is a lot like email. That I can't get an email, but not and it's easy. just another place yeah. to check, and I hate that. Right. So there are people that write me on Facebook, whatever you call their mail system. Ugh, I hate that. I never look at those. Yeah. So sorry if I've ignored that. And then, of course, on Twitter, they have direct messages, which I very rarely look at because most of them are spam. Well, let me explain I, to you. That's because you're following all those people. You, only if you follow them can they direct message you. Yes, so maybe Twitter is something I need to uh, fix. But anyway, right same thing with stuff. Facebook. And I, 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 for at first on Facebook, I let anybody message me, and then I realized yep. exactly that I, the signal to noise was too low. So I turned off the ability only friends can message me, not even friends of friends. Only friends can message me now. Yes. Then Facebook is use, useful again. So the problem is, that I, you know, I just I, don't. But even still. The only reason I know I, I know like this, Paul, that. is I've made the same mistake. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. No, I'm not. I, by the way, I'm not pushing myself as someone who knows what they're doing here. I, that, I hope that's obvious. I, you know, I, I've mentioned the Jerry Purnell thing, where I, you know, I make these mistakes so you don't have to, which is a great worldview. Yeah, I make these mistakes because I'm an right. idiot. Right. But hopefully, you can learn from my mistakes, and not make the same mistake. Right. Anyway, I think I found some decent clients at least. So. That's okay. Um, my favorite Windows 7 client, is that, and it's a work in progress, is actually Metro Twit. It's something we actually had uh, previously as a pick. Um, it looks a lot like the Zoom client. It's written with all these native Windows technologies like .NET 4 and WPF, uh, which is awesome. I happen to like this one a lot. It's very clean, and it has that thing that I'm looking for. It, 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 it was that thing. Of, you know, Early on was always my hugest problem with Twitter, which was that you would get these non sequitur style responses yes. to things and you had no idea what where it came from right so it has a very simple little button that says view conversation you know oh, i like that and then you can yeah now other clients have this but they're often very well hidden um 
or non-existent in some cases that's too. That's very so. handy. So you can see yeah. what somebody's saying in response to and all that stuff. Well, in other words, you get this thing and you don't understand. Like someone will write back and say, I disagree with you completely. Yeah, but what? Uh, okay. There is a little, you know, there's etiquette there's a Twitter, Twitter ism to that, right? Yeah, which is, to, I always kind of try to refer back to the context. Twitter Where is not, alone? no, in fact, nobody knows how to use Twitter because the rules of it are very obscure. For instance, I think a lot of people don't know you can't direct message somebody if, you're not, if they're not following you. If you put an at sign at the beginning of your message, it will only go to that person and the persons who follow both of you. Well, okay, but... There's the all these little is, weird you know, things that are not clear. So just, right. you know, the, don't the blame Twitter yourself. Is, uh, Twitter began as the, the purview of power users. It's now used by everyone. Right. And so, I, and I am one of those everyones. I'm not a power user when it comes to Twitter. So uh, the, what you just said is very sophisticated and is not known. Not known. You know, so uh, it's nice that it exists, but if people don't know it exists, it doesn't matter. So you get these kind of, like I said, non sequitur type responses right. to things. Right. It's just, a, it's the way it is on Twitter. So you have to deal with it. Um, being able to view a conversation in its entirety is beautiful. And by the way, another reason why doing this over an email type thing would be wonderful. But okay. So <laughs> Metro Twit, very good for that. Good, um, on Windows that. Phone 7, uh, I actually like the official Twitter client and have used it. Um, and you can get that. Uh, it's just called Twitter very easily. But I think I believe the highest uh, and most recommend, highest rated and most recommended one is something called ROWI, like R-O-W-I. I'm not sure. If I'm pronouncing that correct, but it is uh, it's a, it's an you know also a very nice looking native uh, Windows Phone implementation for Twitter. So uh, I would say between those two, something to pick up, check out. It looks yeah, like the I, logo is a kiwi, so I'm thinking <coughs> it is Rowy. Rowy. It's, it's like a kiwi from. Rowie. Yeah. So check out if you check out some of the screenshots. Um, it's got that kind of metro looking feel as you would expect. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I think that's a yeah. I I gotta. I'm gonna get that Verizon Windows Phone. <laughs> so I can just play with this stuff. You should. Yeah. Um, mobile app pick, and this is kind of the cross-platform one, is uh, TweetDeck. And this is, this one's, I, I, I could use this one, I think. Uh, I, I, there are some things I don't like about it. It's one of the busier ones. You can kind of tune it down and all that. Uh, but the neat thing about TweetDeck is that it works on Windows, the Mac, and Linux via Air, which is great. I like, right. I like Air like apps for whatever reason. Uh, there are native clients for iPhone, iPad, Android, and Chrome OS and Chrome, um, so you can get that HTML5 version for Chrome. Oh, that's interesting. That. Well, that's nice. And they're actually doing a, a regular web client that will work on all the major browsers. I guess it's in a limited beta right now, but that will be coming soon. So th this is just one that happens to be on a bunch of different platforms, and that's it's pretty good. Um, so TweetDeck is definitely one, uh, depending on your needs. And if you want the same kind of experience, if you have a, a Windows PC and an iPad, for example, this would be a way to uh, use Twitter on both, and it would be a similar experience. Um, but the one, you know, I, I've, I've only been doing this for a couple of weeks. I, you know, anytime there are people out there who will look at what you're tweeting and, and they'll look at what you're using and they'll say, no, you're using the wrong one. You're going to try Oh, this. everybody. It's so I, personal. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really do believe that the, the Twitter app that you use is a personal thing. If, you, if you're going to be on Twitter, you're going to have to spend some time experimenting. It's just the way it is. These are... Uh, Wild, you know, they, they're, they're very different. And uh, Rafael Rivera actually pointed one out to me today that we were both trying today for the first time called Destroy Twitter. Yeah, I love it that sounds, name. I haven't tried it, though. What is it? If you go, it's actually, it's excellent for my needs. It's, again, it's simple. It's got a nice UI. They've got some nice skins so you can make it look like different things and, uh, you know, different uh, styles. But the thing I like about it is just it's you know it's it's simplicity it's it beautiful font rendering it's an air app um, and it's just this is I think what I'm looking for I wish the it has the notion of a uh, view conversation but it's the it's the stupid it's like the the smallest little chevron there's no mouse over it you can't tell that it you know you can't mouse onto it and then have a pop up that tells you what it is. You have to kind of click to figure it Ugh, out. I hate that. They call it dialogue. So these guys must be from the UK or something. But um, so instead of conversation, right, it's dialogue. But uh, okay, but whatever. But it does give you that opportunity to view the conversation. So it's there. And um, yeah, I think this is going to do it. I, I uh, now that I've said that, of course, people will uh, recommend other things and tell me not to use this. It's not perfect. None of them are. And I think that's the thing. You know, with all of these clients. Um, 
some will have this one thing that you love, some will have this other thing, and you know, you kind of go back and forth. But the one thing anyway. I like about TweetDeck is you create a TweetDeck account with all of your accounts in it and remembers that. Yes, so yes, yes, yes. You don't have to re-enter all your data each time. Yeah, which is yes. Nice. That's about the uh, only thing I like about that one. Uh, it's funny you mention that. So uh, when I've installed TweetDeck, uh, I've done it both ways. I wanted to see if you could get into TweetDeck, just configure it for your Twitter, and not go through TweetDeck's account, and you can. And they'll they'll stop bothering you, uh, you know, to log into them That's as well. So you, you, you can do that if you want. Yeah. Um, it's pretty sophisticated. But, I'm looking at the new HTML5 uh, version, which I hadn't yeah. seen oh, yeah, before. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. And yeah. there's some nice features. You can merge accounts into one column. So if you say, I want to follow the tweets from two different accounts, you can do that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. There's some nice features. I love the ability to add uh, trends for search results. So if there's a, you know, if I want to follow uh, Pound Windows Weekly or something, I could. Well, yeah, so this is the thing. So I think what's going to come out of this for me personally is people are going to start suggesting different ways I can, you know, <laughs> use this more effectively. Maybe that's, that's, uh, maybe that's a valuable conversation to have. I don't know. But, I mean, right now uh, my intention is just to kind of get on here and be on here more frequently. And then, um, you know, we'll see. And that's the thing, you know, like I said, these guys... Um, you know, a lot of guys who do the same thing I do, they'll sit there with, usually tweet deck, you know, full screen, multiple columns, all this stuff's going by, you know, and I don't know how, I mean, I just don't, I, maybe my attention span is just such that I can't deal with it. I don't know. I, I, I don't no, know that I'll ever right. get there. But. No, you're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> we'll see. I, I look at people like Scoble who follow, you know, four, yeah. four times what you're following. I, I, just... saw, I saw Scoble last week. He was one of the people at our show. Uh, we did a a panel, and I, I, I said to him, uh, the, I hosted, the, or I moderated the panel he was on, you know. So he kind of came. I hadn't, I hadn't seen him in a while. I, I know Robert from way back, mid-90s. And um, I said, you know, I was just thinking about you this morning in the shower. <laughs> and he says, can I tweet that? I said, no, no, you can't tweet that. <laughs> <laughs> but now you've said it on your nationally... Yeah. Internationally known podcast. What I meant by that, Leo, was, <laughs> you know, as you would in the shower, as you could, I guess. I know what you're thinking. You think of the day ahead and the things you have to oh. do. Oh, oh, that's not what I was. I see. Paul Thorat, we have come to the end of this show, but not the end of the day because Microsoft is about to announce. Yeah. So let's see if they've done it. Let's see what they've said. Usually, there's a pre-announce before the call uh, that you could probably get all the numbers it. from. Not see it. I believe they, yeah, they must have a live call. It's not out yet. Let's see. Financial, financial, financial. Where is this stuff? It used to be so easy to find. Investor relations. Microsoft. Nope. Nope, not yet. Okay. Uh, well, well, actually, there's leave a Leave that as an exercise for the listener. Oh, well. By the well, way, Hulu Plus for Xbox comes out tomorrow. Fantastic. Are they still they around, those guys? Yes, they are. Neat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't uh, see. Yeah, I guess not. So Paul, maybe can it's I just Vista. say, mm -hmm. you are the Grand Vizier of Vista. <laughs> the King of Clippy. The boss of Microsoft, Bob. My friend, you are the Sultan of Search Dog. Yikes. And we thank you for today deigning to spend some time with us and to give us, to share with us the light of your wisdom. I wow. thank you, sir. I don't deserve anything you just said. Sim except for the best of one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. I enjoyed it as well. I have no lofty words, but <laughs> have a uh, have a great week. I hope you feel better, uh, you. and uh, we'll talk to you. We do the show every Thursday at uh, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern at Live. Twit. TV, so you can watch live. And I have to say, it's fun to watch live because. Uh, that's before we've cut out all the expletives, all the screaming, mm -hmm. the swearing, and the whistleblowing. If you want to see some real Tourette's, you should see me when I'm on Xbox Live. There's a reason I mute my microphone. Zombies! Scrum! Hate them! Zombies! Um, so go off and uh, enjoy your Call of Duty map. <laughs> and, uh, I'm going to answer the Call of Duty next week. Leo. Answer the Call of Duty, my friend, and we will see you next week. Don't forget, you can subscribe to this show. Just go to TWIT.TV slash dub dub for Windows Weekly and uh, we get all the information there. Thank you, Paulie. Thank you, sir. Have a great week and we'll see you next time.
pounds. How big is it? How big is it? It's 100. Well, that should be enough for anybody. Oh, I disagree. In fact, I have <laughs> I have experience that suggests otherwise. <laughs> oh, here we go. The results are in. What happened? I think I'm going to name this show I Thought About You in the Shower. <laughs> yeah, he it's would a like good that. name. It says Microsoft beats Q3 estimates thanks to Connect in Office. Awesome. Uh, yeah, 16.43 billion Jeez. in revenues. Uh, dick, 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 dick. So Apple made three billion profit. How much did Microsoft make? It does not say. It says analysts were expecting them to post earnings of 56 cents per share, but they blew past that with 61 cents per share. And not wait, there's a link. Oh, here it is. Uh, here, where is it? A. Hello. Net income, $5.23 billion. Jeez. Oh, man. What did you say, Apple? What was Apple? Oh, I'm sorry. Apple made 5.99. 5.99, yeah. That's incredible. That's, yeah, both so are despite, incredible. Yeah, despite a mixed PC environment, blah, 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 yeah. Consumers purchasing Office, Xbox, and Connect. Uh, Windows, uh, yeah, revenue for the Windows, se the Windows segment was down 4%. In line with PC trends, online services grew four. That's interesting. Entertainment grew sixty. Server grew eleven. Microsoft Business grew twenty-one. Those are the online guys. Uh, SharePoint Online, Exchange Online. <coughs> oh, there you go. There you go. I'll think about that in the shower. Alrighty. There she is, the royal bride, stunning in a white dress. <laughs> Or, where Paul has said, I'm an, I've had enough of this. I've had enough. I want to get back to Call of Duty. Please stop. 